Hey everyone, and welcome. Ever stop to think about what you really are? I mean, deep down, at the most fundamental level? Today we're diving headfirst into one of the most mind-bending concepts in all of science. What we will explore today is a fundamental truth about the universe. It says that everything, yes, everything, including you and me, can behave like both a particle and a wave. In this video, we're not just going to explore this mind-bending concept, but we're also going to tackle some of the most misunderstood aspects of quantum mechanics, breaking them down in simple terms so that we can all truly grasp the strangeness and wonder of the quantum world. Keep watching, because by the end of this video, you won't just understand it, you'll be questioning the very fabric of reality. Our adventure into the quantum world starts with an experiment that's so strange, so completely mind-boggling, that it's often said to be the starting point of quantum mechanics. I'm talking about the famous double-slit experiment. Imagine for a moment that you're throwing tennis balls at a wall that has two narrow slits cut into it. If you picture what would happen on a screen behind the wall, it's pretty straightforward, right? You'd expect to see two distinct lines of tennis balls directly behind each slit. This is particle behavior. It's exactly what we'd expect, and it makes perfect sense in our everyday experience. But now let's switch from tennis balls to light. For centuries, scientists debated the true nature of light. Is it a wave, like ripples spreading across water, or is it composed of tiny particles? This question was at the heart of a long-standing debate. In the 17th century, Isaac Newton famously proposed that light was made of particles, a theory known as the corpuscular theory of light. According to Newton, light was simply a stream of particles that traveled through space and interacted with objects. This idea was widely accepted for many years. However, in the early 1800s, a British scientist named Thomas Young challenged this well-known theory. He decided to figure this out with a clever experiment designed to understand the nature of light. He sent light through those two openings, expecting to see two simple lines of light if light was just made of particles as it was widely believed then. However, what Young actually saw was completely unexpected. Instead of just two lines, he saw a pattern of many lines with bright areas and dark areas next to each other. This pattern is called an interference pattern, and it's a clear sign of waves. Think about those water ripples again. When two waves interact, their high points can combine to create a larger wave, similar to the bright areas in Young's pattern. But when the high point of one wave meets the low point of another, they cancel each other out, creating flat areas, like the dark regions in the pattern. Young's experiment showed that light does exactly the same thing. It looked like light was definitely a wave. So, problem solved, or so it seemed. This wave-like behavior wasn't just limited to light. In fact, it was observed in everything that we consider matter, protons, electrons, neutrons, and other particles. These are known as quantum particles, and they all follow the same strange rules of quantum mechanics. But the quantum world is never simple, and it always has more surprises. Scientists were really interested by Young's discovery, and they wanted to look closer. They wondered, okay, light acts like a wave, but let's try to be even more precise. Let's try to see which opening each tiny bit of light, also known as photon, actually goes through. So they cleverly put detectors right next to the openings, basically watching to see the path of the light. And this is where things got truly strange again. The interference pattern vanished completely. Just by trying to watch which opening the light was going through, the light suddenly stopped acting like a wave. It went back to acting like particles, and again made those two simple lines behind the openings just like tennis balls would. This phenomenon is known as the famous observer effect, and at first, it left scientists scratching their heads, thinking, what on earth is happening here? Is it possible that simply by observing light, we're changing how it behaves? It seemed like our very act of watching was altering reality itself. But this led to a major misunderstanding that still persists today. Some even started to believe that it was our car conscious, our minds, that were causing this change in behavior. The idea emerged, could our minds be so powerful that just by thinking about light, we can change it? Hold on a minute, let's clear that up. 
This isn't about human consciousness having magical powers, and it's certainly not mind control. In fact, it's something much simpler and more incredible than that. What's crucial to understand here is that in quantum mechanics, all these confusion comes because of the word observation. Observer effect is not about your mind being present. It's about measurement, the act of interacting with the system in some way, probably with a detector that emits a photon in the process. When you try to measure something in the quantum world, that very act of measurement changes the system you're trying to observe. To explain this more clearly, in order to determine which slit a photon passes through, you can't just look at it from afar. You have to interact with it by bouncing another photon off it using detector. This interaction forces the quantum system to choose a definite state. Instead of behaving like a wave that could go through both slits at once, the photon now acts like a particle and goes through only one slit. What we're dealing with here are the strange, counterintuitive rules of quantum measurement. But now, we're left with an important question. What exactly is a measurement in the quantum world, and why is it so different from how we measure things in our everyday lives? That's the next mystery to solve. In quantum mechanics, measurements aren't like the ones we're used to in our everyday world. In our everyday world, measuring things is usually pretty simple. If you want to know how long something is, you grab a ruler. If you want to know the temperature, you use a thermometer. These measurements typically don't change the things we're measuring. But in the quantum world, it's a whole different story. Here, you can measure various properties of quantum particles, such as spin, which tells you the direction a particle is spinning. Polarization, which describes the orientation of light waves. Position, which shows where a particle is located and momentum, which tells you how fast a particle is moving, and so on. Unlike everyday measurements, these quantum measurements are much more active and very sensitive to external disturbances. When you try to measure a quantum system, the act of measurement actually influences the system you're observing. Quantum particles don't have definite properties until you measure them. Before you interact with them, they exist in a state called superposition, where they can be in multiple states at once. For example, the spin of an electron can be both up and down simultaneously until you measure it. Much like a coin spinning, it's in a state of uncertainty, spinning between heads and tails until it lands on one side. It's only when you measure one of these properties that the quantum system chooses a definite state. And that's what makes quantum measurements so strange. This behavior is completely different from the way we measure objects in the everyday world where simply observing something doesn't change its state. Basically, the quantum world is a realm of possibilities and probabilities, and when we measure, we're essentially picking one of those possibilities and making it real. As we've established, quantum particles like electrons exist as waves when not being measured, meaning their position is not definite. Instead, it's expressed as a probability. For example, imagine a box containing an electron, you can't say with certainty where the electron is, but you can describe the probability of finding it in different places, maybe a 30% chance in one spot and an 80% chance in another. But when you measure its position, you pick one of these possibilities, forcing the electron to exist in a specific spot. This act of picking, of forcing a quantum system to choose a specific state, has significant consequences, as a German physicist Werner Heisenberg in 1927 demonstrated. Now, if measuring quantum systems changes them so dramatically, does that mean there are things about the quantum world we can never truly know? The answer is a definite yes. This limitation is described by one of the most famous concepts in physics, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Formulated by Heisenberg, the principle states that there's a fundamental limit to how precisely we can know certain pairs of properties of a quantum particle at the same time. The most well-known example of these pairs is position and momentum. This means that the more precisely you measure a particle's position, the less precisely you can measure its momentum, and vice versa. It's not due to flaws in our measurement tools, it's an intrinsic property of nature. Even with the most advanced equipment, we can never know both the position and momentum of a particle with perfect accuracy at the same time. 
To help make sense of this, imagine you're in a game and a tennis ball is moving at high speed. If you take a regular photo of it, the ball will appear still in the image. In this case, you'd know its exact position, but you wouldn't be able to tell in which direction it's moving. Now, if you take a high exposure shot of the fast moving ball, the image would show the motion blur of the ball, giving you a good idea of the direction it's moving in, but you won't be able to pinpoint its exact position. This is like the uncertainty principle. When you measure one property very precisely, you lose accuracy in the other. This uncertainty is not just a minor quirk of quantum mechanics. It's deeply connected to the wave particle nature of quantum systems. And to understand why, we need to go back to talking about waves, again. Remember we said everything can act like both a wave and a particle, but how do we describe this mathematically? How do we show just how wavy a particle is, or how particle-like a wave can be? In 1924, the French physicist Louis de Broglie made a groundbreaking contribution to our understanding of wave-particle duality. He proposed a revolutionary idea. If light, which we thought of as a wave, could also behave like a particle, in the form of photons, then perhaps particles, like the ones that make up matter, could also exhibit wave-like behavior. De Broglie came up with a simple yet crucial equation to describe this idea. This equation connects the wave-like and particle-like behaviors of all moving objects. Let's break it down. Lambda represents the wavelength of the particle, showing how much it behaves like a wave. A longer wavelength means it's more wave-like. P stands for the momentum, which is the product of mass and velocity of the particle. It tells us how much this acts like a particle. The greater the momentum, the more particle-like it becomes. Finally, H is Planck's constant, a fundamental number in quantum mechanics, which is an incredibly tiny value. Now, why is Planck's constant so important? It tells us that in the quantum world, energy and momentum exist in discrete chunks, or quanta. It's like the smallest possible unit of quantumness that nature can have. So, de Broglie's equation reveals something remarkable. Everything that moves has a wavelength, whether it's electrons, protons, atoms, or even large objects like tennis balls, they all have wavelengths. Though we typically don't notice it with larger objects because their wavelengths are too tiny to detect. Moreover, this equation links the particle and wave behaviors together. It beautifully links the wave aspect, wavelength, and the particle aspect, momentum, of everything in the universe. It is the mathematical key that shows the deep connection between waves and particles. If everything is really both a wave and a particle, why don't we see ourselves acting like waves? Why don't we walk through walls or see people interfering with each other like waves? Why does the world around us seem so normal and not quantum at all? The answer lies again in Planck's constant and de Broglie's equation. For large objects, things we can see, like tennis balls, cars, or people, the situation is different. Our mass and momentum are huge compared to tiny quantum particles. According to de Broglie's equation, a large momentum means the wavelength is incredibly small. For example, the wavelength of a tennis ball, which, which weighs around 60 grams and moves at a speed of 1 meter per second, would be around 10 to the power of negative 34 meters, which is so small that it's completely undetectable. Its wave-like properties are so tiny that they don't influence its behavior in any noticeable way. In essence, a tennis ball behaves entirely like a normal particle. But for tiny particles like electrons, the story is different. An electron has a mass of about 9.11 times 10 to the power of negative 31 kilograms and a typical momentum that might be around 10 to the power of negative 24 kilogram meter per second. Using de Broglie's equation, the wavelength of this electron turns out to be around 10 to the power of negative 10 meters, or 0.1 nanometers, which is about the size of an atom. This wavelength is large enough that it can be measured in experiments, and the electron's wave-like behavior becomes very significant in quantum mechanics. So it's not that large, objects don't have wave behavior. It's just that their wavelengths are so incredibly small that we can't observe them in our everyday life. Quantum mechanics governs the tiny world because at that scale, Planck's constant and de Broglie's equation make wave behavior significant. 
Another important reason why large objects like tennis balls don't show quantum behavior has to do with the concept of decoherence. Decoherence is a process that happens when quantum particles interact with their environment, causing their wave-like behavior to effectively collapse and transform into classical behavior. This phenomenon becomes especially important as the number of particles involved in an object increases. As we mentioned before, in the quantum world, every particle exists in a superposition of states behaving like a wave and existing in multiple places or states at once. However, when quantum particles like electrons come together to form larger systems, such as atoms or molecules, each of these particles still retains its wave-like nature. But as these particles interact with one another and with the environment, such as air molecules, light, and other factors, their wave functions start to interfere with each other. In the case of larger objects, like a tennis ball, these are composed of trillions of atoms, and each of those atoms has its own quantum wave-like behavior. As they interact with each other, the tiny individual quantum waves of the atoms start to overlap and interfere in complex ways. This interference causes the different quantum states to cancel out in a process called decoherence. The result of decoherence is that the system as a whole behaves like a classical object, just like the tennis ball behaving as a solid, macroscopic particle, rather than a quantum wave. The collective interference of all the quantum states effectively washes out any noticeable wave-like behavior. This process happens incredibly quickly in large systems. The more particles there are, the more interactions there are between them and the surrounding environment. This is why, in our everyday world, we don't notice wave-like behavior from large objects, even though, on a fundamental level, all matter behaves quantum mechanically. To make this idea even more mind-boggling, scientists have managed to observe coherence in much larger systems than single particles. In fact, they've successfully demonstrated quantum behavior in molecules containing more than 2,000 atoms, an astonishing achievement. By carefully isolating these molecules from their environment and using advanced techniques like laser cooling, scientists can slow down the molecules enough to prevent them from interacting with the environment in ways that cause decoherence. This allows these large molecules to retain their quantum properties, exhibiting behaviors like interference and superposition, much like the tiny particles we usually think of as quantum objects. Now, what if scientists were able to re-cohere even larger structures, like a tennis ball, which consists of millions of atoms? If they could somehow prevent all the interactions between these atoms and their environment, the tennis ball could, in theory, exhibit quantum phenomena, such as wave-like behavior and interference existing in multiple places at once. However, while this idea sounds fascinating, it's extremely unlikely to happen in practice. The sheer complexity and the number of atoms in an object like a tennis ball would make it nearly impossible to isolate it from its surroundings long enough to prevent decoherence. The interactions between all of the atoms and with the environment around them would cause the system to collapse into classical behavior almost instantaneously. The energy required to preserve coherence in such a large system would be astronomically high, and keeping a tennis ball in a pure quantum state would be far beyond our current technological abilities. But what if we could take things even further? Now, if you thought this was mind-blowing, just wait until you explore quantum entanglement and quantum teleportation, where particles far apart can be instantly connected, and information can actually be teleported across space, and scientists have made incredible breakthroughs in this area. If you're curious to learn more, check out my other video where I dive into the science behind entanglement and teleportation. You don't want to miss it. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe for more mind-blowing science, and tell me in the comments, what other quantum mysteries should we explore next time? Thanks for watching, and keep wondering.